Okay, sounds good. So um, my name is Manuel. I'm a postdoc at ETH Zurich. Um, I'm working at the Advanced Software Technologies Lab and in the past uh, couple of, of years or so, we have been working on uh, finding bugs in database management systems via automatic testing techniques. This is some work that I did in cooperation with Professor Chen Su, who uh, also leads the ESD lab. So, uh, by the way, if you have some questions, you can either um, basically interrupt me in between or you can also ask at the end, so whatever format you, you prefer. Now the goal of our work is to find logic bugs in database management systems, which poses the first question, what are logic bugs? So as logic bugs, we define those bugs um, that when we have, for example, a query like the following, and we send it to the database management system, then the database management system is expected to go through all the relevant records. So here, for example, we have a database where um, this predicate evaluates to true for two rows, and for one, it evaluates to false. So by the way, just in general, I will use this phi symbol here to denote a, a Boolean predicate. Now, if the database management system works correctly, then we would, of course, expect that these two rows for which the predicate evaluates to true uh, are fetched. Now, logic bugs, we define them as those bugs where the database management system returns or fetches an incorrect result set. So basically, this could mean that only one rather than the two rows are fetched, that maybe a row is mistakenly fetched, so row three here, or that the contents of the um, data that is fetched is incorrect. So we believe that um, finding logic bugs is rather difficult and, and challenging because, first of all, they often go unnoticed by both users of the system and also uh, by developers. Because, for example, unlike crash bugs, where um, the process exits with an error, it's unclear when a logic bug is triggered. So isn't the problem already solved? Uh, I guess many of you are familiar actually with, with a SQLite uh, testing process, which is probably the most well-documented, also the, the most impressive one. And actually, it would appear so because, for example, SQLite, um, they state on their homepage that they have about several hundred times as much test code as they do have source code. Also, SQLite's test case has achieved 100% branch test coverage, and even more, they uh, achieve 100% MCDC coverage, which is a stricter coverage metri metric that is, um, that is typically used in the aviation industry. And uh, before the talk, we actually tried to discuss that SQLite is also used uh, for, for such applications. Then SQLite is extensively fast, so both by Google's Open Source Fast project, but also um, recently researchers have uh, started looking into this. Um, and um, besides a uh, typical kind of testing like unit testing or integration testing, SQLite also does, for example, anomaly testing where the developers even ensure that the database management system works correctly in the presence of out-of-memory errors, input-output errors, and for example, power failures. Uh, nevertheless, we found, um, I think, over 450 bugs in uh, popular and widely used database management systems. And of course, you know that uh, we, we have uh, also tested DuckDB, but also uh, SQLite, like we found bugs in SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, CockroachDB, and TidyDB. Now the question is how um, did we achieve this? And in order to explain this, I first want to um, explain the challenges of automatic software testing in general, and also specifically here in the context for testing database management systems. So the first uh, ingredient is that we need an effective test case that has the chance to expose a bug uh, by the database management system. For this, they basically have two components. First, we need to generate a meaningful database, and then we need to generate a, a meaningful query. And uh, the second ingredient is that we need a test oracle that can decide whether the query's result is as expected or not. Now, um, uh, the work or how we generate a databases and queries is not the focus of this talk, but um, since actually um, in, in my last talk, I received quite some questions about this. I still want to shortly um, 
give an overview how we generate uh, queries and databases. So basically, there have been many uh, papers um, proposed or, or many approaches have been proposed on how to generate databases. So based on certain uh, characteristics or for example, um, by taking a query as an input and generating a database that, um, that returns rows and so on. So I, I would argue that this is actually a quite well understood topic and I don't want to go too much into detail. I merely want to present here how we generate random databases. Basically, we have two phases in this process. First, we generate random tables. So here we can see that we have a table T0 and a table T1. And for this uh, generation of uh, statements, in general, we have low and upper limits that are configurable by the user. And then we select applicable other actions. For example, we insert into a table, uh, into tables, we update or modify values, we create indexes. And um, what I want to note here is if we look at the last statement, you can actually see that um, statements might also fail or be redundant. So here we try to insert the value zero twice. And as you can see, um, here we have a unique constraint, which is why this query will not uh, succeed. And this database generation um, mechanism, as well as the query generation mechanism, is implemented for each database management system under test. So this needs to be done for, for every database management system. But in my experience, this is actually uh, quite, quite straightforward to implement and also not, not much implementation effort. Now, also, um, random and targeted query generation is, is widely understood. So uh, probably most of you know, um, know SQL Smith, as I think it's also used for DuckDB. Correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, there are also many other approaches to generate uh, queries, for example, based on data or, or uh, according to other characteristics. So we generate um, random queries. But basically, the core challenge is to randomly generate expressions. And for this, we also have the most naive uh, approach possible. So for example, we randomly select one uh, operator. Here we have the, the is not one, and then we just generate um, the true ch children that it requires, for which here we have uh, selected a column reference and, and the literal. So also here, I, I don't want to go uh, more into detail than this. What I want to focus on is how we came up with or how we propose a test oracles for finding logic max. So basically, what, what is a test oracle? A test oracle for a given input determines whether the system works as expected. Now, what, what applicable oracles could we consider when uh, trying to test for logic max? So basically, if we use a random query generator like SQL Smith that generates a query that is sent to the database management system, um, then this might trigger a segmentation fault or some other internal error. But fuzzing, um, unfortunately, cannot detect logic bugs because um, these um, go undetected by, by fuzzing. Another approach that is uh, frequently mentioned or also frequently used in automatic testing is differential testing. In our context, this means that we have a query generator that generates one random query that is sent to multiple database management systems, for example, Postgres, MySQL, and, and SQLite, each of which fetches a result set, which can, can be compared. If all the result sets match, then we haven't detected a bug. Um, if there is a mismatch, then at least one of the database management systems is expected to be affected by a bug. So this is actually, I would say, that the most um, relevant approach also today. It was first proposed by Microsoft Research in around 2000. And um, the author of, this, uh, of the corresponding paper stated that this uh, is an extremely useful technique because it allowed them to uncover many bugs, but only for the small set of common SQL. And this is actually the experience that we also made with this approach. Basically, every database management system that we looked at, they first of all do not follow the SQL standard in, in all aspects, or they provide extensions to it. And this is also confirmed by uh, companies. So for example, Cockroach Labs, they published a 
blog post on on how they automatically test um, their database management system. And they, they said that they are unable to use Postgres as an Oracle. So Postgres is the database management system that whose SQL dialect is closest to CockroachDB. Um, basically because they both have a different semantics and are generating queries that execute identically on both is, is not that trivial. Another problem that is um, interesting, I think, is that differential testing does not provide what we call is a ground truth. So it might be that um, database management systems are affected by the same underlying bugs. And this is actually can happen in practice. So we found, for example, bugs that affected both uh, TidyDB and MySQL, as here pointed out by a TidyDB developer. So besides fuzzing and differential testing, also other approaches have been proposed. I just very quickly want to go over them. So um, one approach specifically to finding logic bugs is a sulfur-based one by Kalak and others. They could reproduce a number of bugs, also could find injected bugs, but um, they only found one potentially new bug. So here we believe that uh, sulfurs might be too slow um, to be effective in an approach like this. Another interesting system is Apollo. So um, here, Chung and Ali uh, and others, they basically um, focused on, on another testing problem, namely performance. And similar also with uh, Hu and others, they wanted to test the uh, accuracy of the, um, of the query plan or of the um, cost estimation. But um, I guess we need to summarize based on this that the problem of testing database management systems to find logic bugs has not yet been well addressed. Towards this end, we have proposed uh, three approaches uh, so far. Um, so pivotal query synthesis PQS is our first approach, which has found uh, about 100 bugs in, in SQLite, uh, MySQL, and Postgres. And the core idea of this approach is that we we'll want to generate a query for which it is guaranteed that it fetches a random row, uh, which to which we refer as the pivot row. So it's basically a divide and conquer approach. The second approach that we came up with is non-optimizing reference engine construction or NORAC, whose goal is to detect optimization bugs specifically, so bugs in the in the query optimizer, by rewriting the query in a way that it uh, cannot or, or shouldn't be optimized. And the latest approach we came up with is ternary logic query partitioning, TLB, where the idea is that we have uh, some original query from which we derive partitioning queries that partition the result set. And then at the end, we get the result set that should be equal to the original one of the, of the first query. So um, in this here I want to focus on the latest uh, two approaches that we came up with. So uh, NORAC and TLB. Not sure if some of, of you watched the CMU talk which went online yesterday, um, where basically I only prevent, presented the second part, but here I will also represent the NORAC part since we have a little bit more time. And um, just to, to note here, the TLB one, which is our latest approach, is the one that we also implemented to test DuckDB. All three approaches are implemented in, in SQL Lancer, synthesized uh, query Lancer, which is available on GitHub since last um, week. And uh, yeah, feel free to check it out. Um, it's, uh, we would appreciate any bug reports uh, that you have. And actually, I think it's, it's easier to find bugs in our system than it is uh, to, to find bugs in, in the database systems. Uh, I will let a fuzzer loose on SQL Lancer. Oh no, <laughs> that would be bad. Um, yeah, so with that, I want to start with the first approach, namely non-optimizing reference engine construction, or short uh, NORAC. So um, the goal with this approach is that we wanted to find a very specific category of logic bugs, namely bugs that affect the query optimizer. And a goal was to make this technique, first of all, yeah, make it easy to realize, like both in terms of implementation effort required to realize the technique, and also in terms of how difficult it is to reason about it. So what are optimization bugs? Well, we can basically take our initial 
figure and this time just assume that the career optimizer is uh, causing this incorrect result set. Now, probably many of, of you know compilers like, like GCC or LVM, where we have or we can use optimization of flags like O3 and O0. So O3 basically means that uh, most of the optimizations are turned on and O0 that the majority of them are turned off. And actually, if we would have something like this for database management systems, it would be perfect because then we could once generate a query that we execute with the optimizing version of the database management system and once with the non-optimizing one. And if the uh, query optimizer is affected by bug that is then triggered, then we would expect that we would get a different result set and we could basically confirm the result set to determine whether they, they are the same or not. If not, we have directly a bug in, in the query optimizer. That's, that's our assumption. So I, I will just mention that this approach is excellent and that we actually do this in DuckDB standard. So if you enable query verification, we call this, we will run for every query, both an optimized and unoptimized version and compare the answers. And it finds really a lot of bugs. Like it's really, uh, really great. It's also one of the reasons why we wanted our system to be correct without any optimizers, which was one of the uh, problems we had with Minetibi actually, that it required optimizers to execute queries correctly. Um, but having like the unoptimized plan work as well allows you to do this testing technique, which is super powerful. Oh, that's that's very cool. Like uh, we were actually surprised to learn that uh, most database management systems do not have something like this, and, and we were surprised about it. So I'm glad to hear that um, DuckDB actually implements this. And I also believe um, probably it's it's easier if uh, if basically you come up with a new database management system that you implement this. But I guess now, for example, if we look at uh, systems like like MySQL or Postgres or so then maybe retrospectively adding this um, kind of options would, would be difficult. But I'm glad that you made uh, good, good experiences with this and uh, thought about this in, in advance, which, which is a smart move. Yeah, I think one of the problems with adding it later on is that you kind of, when they develop the system, they make it so it just runs correctly um, end to end. And then it can be that they have a bug in the core engine that they fix with an optimizer. And uh, actually, when we first added this feature was like a few uh, months after the initial release, and we found this as well, that there was bugs in the core version without the optimizer. So, and that was just a few months. Like I imagine a system that's a lot, a lot older is gonna have a lot of bugs that optimizers actually fix rather than, uh, so the unoptimized version will not even run basically. Ah, that's, that's very insightful. I never considered about this case, but uh, for that I'm lucky to have you folks here uh, knowing more about uh, database management systems. So that's, that's great. Thanks for the input. Um, yeah, so basically the idea was uh, since um, it would be difficult to retrospectively add this kind of options in other system, systems, we wanted to um, basically not rely on the database management system for this but rewrite the query in a way that the database management system is expected to not optimize it. And the idea is basically illustrated here. So you can see that we have a query generator that first generates an optimized query. We call it the optimized query, but actually we don't give any guarantees that the database management system indeed optimizes it. But that's, um, that's our assumption. And um, this version here would or could trigger a bug in the query optimizer, in which case an uh, incorrect result set would be returned. And then we would have this translation step that, um, that transforms or that derives an unoptimized query from this optimized query, uh, which is expected to trigger less optimizations and here, for example, not trigger the bug in the query optimizer, in which case we could uh, compare the two result sets and, uh, and infer that uh, the database version system is affected by a bug. Now, um, I guess this, this sounds plausible in principle, but of course it's, it's not very obvious on how, how this trans translation step should actually look like. And this is the core contribution of, uh, of this approach here. What I want also to state in advance is that now I'm going to present that, um, how the approach works by only checking the number of rows that are returned. Actually our technique is also applicable to check the records content but we found that it's sufficient 
to only count the rows to detect the majority of bugs that this technique can, can find. So here is the thematic ingredient. Um, we have this optimized query of this uh, general format here, where we select all um, records where phi here holds. And we assume here that, uh, first of all, the query optimizer works correctly. So it would return here uh, two records. And we can see here, based on these two records, we can infer that phi evaluates to true for two rows. Now for the unoptimized query, uh, it looks in the following way. So basically, we take the file predicate, we move it directly after the select, and you can see here that also we do not have a work loss. So what effect does this query have? Basically, it means that, um, first of all, we fetch as many rows as there are contained in the uh, tables or the, the cross product of the tables. And for every record where this phi evaluates to true, we have a true in the result set, and for every predicate where it evaluates to false, we, we have a false in the result set. Also assuming uh, that null evaluates to, to false for simplicity. And uh, from this, we can then count how often true is actually contained in the result set. You can see here it's contained twice, and these uh, two actually have to, to correspond to each other, right? So the number of uh, rows that are fetched for the first query and how often five is to true for the second one. Question. Mm -hmm. What are your assumptions about what can be in the select clause? Only projection columns or arbitrary SQL sub-expressions? Um, so we haven't evaluated the approach for subqueries, for example. Because that, that triggers lots of actually reshuffling in common term evaluation. So this is only possible if the star is a projection list. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry again, um, I, I didn't get the last. This only answer. works if the star is a projection list, because as soon as you actually uh, allow their subqueries, mm -hmm. then optimizers may shuffle the whole thing around. So that just dropping them and by replacing with the last predicate is insufficient. Ah, I see. That's that's very interesting. Thanks for the input. So in general, actually, in our um, approach here, we do not give any guarantees on on actually that the database management system, like that, all optimizations are are disabled. It's basically um, just the insight that it disables many many of them. Well, that's correct because uh, the number of knobs in, an, in a good optimizer is in order of a few hundred, which means mm -hmm. that the spend space you have to think about is about to the power a hundred. I see. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the input. Um, and um, just to, to recap on uh, what, what the result uh, set is. So for the first query, it was that the result set contains the original rows. And for the second one, we have a result set uh, containing both uh, true and false values, namely as many as, uh, as there are rows, um, yeah, or uh, the cross product of, of rows in the tables. And the insight why this uh, works from our perspective, but I'm again glad here to hear your perspective, is that most optimizations aim to reduce the amount of uh, data that is processed. For example, um, if indexes here are applicable, and might uh, result in a speed up, then they will likely be used. But here, for the second unoptimized query, the predicate must anyway be evaluated on every row. Every row um, must be fetched, which is why uh, these are not applicable here. So basically, the translated query cannot be efficiently optimized by the database management system. But uh, as Martin pointed out, that there are, of course, cases where this doesn't hold. And actually, uh, I think Martin also pointed out in, in an earlier email that um, it might be that the, that the unoptimized query is actually processed incorrectly rather than the optimized one. And we indeed found uh, four, four cases or so where, where this was the case. So um, what, maybe one more uh, consideration there is that this doesn't catch expression rewrites uh, because those can still be applied, right? So if you have like a very complex expression, there can still be expression rewrites going on that can happen in either in both cases, basically. So it's, it's a, indeed there are still optimizations that can happen, but the big ones like index, joins and such, they are uh, indeed negated by this, which is uh, good. All right, thanks for the, for the input. Mm. So, 
So how can this approach be um, implemented? So there is also a, a small insight that we can um, use aggregate functions to make the implementation even easier. So for the optimized query, we can uh, use this account aggregate function, which um, turned out to still detect the majority of, of bugs that uh, this approach can detect. So here, for example, for the incorrect case, we would get a single row with the value of one. And for the unoptimized case, we can also use an aggregate function, namely sum here. And um, here, basically, every time where this phi evaluates to one, um, this gets summed up. And otherwise, if it evaluates to false or null, it, um, it is cast to, to a zero. But of course, the, the um, concrete implementation here depends on the database management system. I, I think for DuckDB, it wouldn't have a, a, like you would need an explicit cast to, to do this. And, and of course, the second query can be optimized to the first query, again, if the optimizer is clever enough. So uh, it, it is assu this assumes the optimizer is a certain level of clever where it's not super clever, but it's like kind of in the middle, you know? <laughs> I see. Yeah, so, so actually to, to, in order to um, address this, we actually do a mixture of both approaches. So for example, also for the optimized query, we have once the one with a count, and we also sometimes use the other version where we manually iterate over the records. But uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting insight. Um, and this basically also allows to simply check whether um, the integer returned in this uh, single rows is the same or not. Um, just to convince you that the technique uh, works in practice, I want to show you one example, namely for SQLite. Here you can see that we create a table, we insert a value of minus one, and then we have here this optimized query where the predicate is a regular expression. And um, I think the nice thing about the technique is now that we don't, we don't have to start thinking about what the result of the query should be. The only thing that we need to do is we send it to SQLite. It returns, or it returned, because now the bug is fixed, it returned um, an empty result set. And for the unoptimized query, it returned a single row, which is expected, but the value in there is true from which we can infer that the result should actually contain a row, which was not the case, and which is why we could detect this as a bug and report it to the, to the SQLite developers. So using this approach, we have found over 60 bugs, um, many of which have been fixed. So in SQLite, MariaDB, Postgres, and CockroachDB. So here we concentrated our testing efforts on SQLite, and I, I want to note in general that, um, that the number of bugs does not reflect how, how mature or robust the database management system is. It rather reflects how, how serious the developers took our bug reports. So uh, I mentioned previously, actually, you, Mark, and the, the DuckDB team and the SQLite developers, they were actually amazing in how quickly we have fixed the bugs. And, uh, and this allowed us to comprehensively test SQLite and, and DuckDB in contrast to, to some of the other widely used uh, systems where we couldn't co comprehensively test them simply because um, we found too many duplicate bugs. Uh, duplicate bugs. Um, of the bugs that we found, only one third or so were optimization bugs which we aimed to find, but it's, it's still a, a quite a high number, I would say, so the approach works. Um, unexpectedly, we didn't find any optimization bug in Postgres, and Postgres in general seems to have been a, a more robust against our testing efforts, since also with PQS, we found only a single logic bug, and with our latest approach, we haven't uh, found uh, any, any bugs in it. Error and crash bugs um, are the majority of the bugs that we found, but actually we uh, don't um, care as much about them because they can be found by existing approaches like uh, FASAS that I presented initially. So here, this might suggest that they're either more common or easier to find. Great. Um, do you have any comments or questions about uh, NORIC at this stage? If not, I can also continue with, with TLB and uh, we can discuss afterwards. It is fine for me. Yeah, just uh, from me, sorry, I'm uh, hiding in the bushes here. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for the... Um, for the intro in, the, in, the, in this logic uh, switching of the optimizers thing. Um, 
did you look into um, maybe flags for optimizers in various systems? So I know that Postgres has like a hundred optimizer parameters and those could possibly be uh, misused uh, to, to generate plan alternatives that you could test uh, against. Yeah, so actually we uh, generate this in our database uh, generator. So for all the systems that we looked at, we actually generate all this, but um, it seems that this hasn't been really effective in, in finding bugs. One reason might be just um, that actually the database management system developers also use these flex to um, do this kind of differential testing where they once enable and once disable the, the flex. And the space is just too large. The space is just too large. Just consider 100 knobs to tune. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So your space is already 2 to the power 10. So. Yeah, yeah thanks. It's also true. Okay, thanks. Right, then I will. So, sorry, Manuel, um, Stefan here. A, a very brief question, actually. Uh, in, in your example, in the count example, in the unoptimized query, you added the explicit is true um, for, for the predicate uh, to evaluate. Is it actually necessary because your, your phi already evaluates the true or false? And the is true, again, just re evaluates to true or false. So, is it is uh, true? It's I was wondering. Um, I... Yeah, uh, actually, I remember there was a reason, but I don't remember the reason okay. now. It, it might be it might be that uh, for one database management system that um, provided, I guess, a sum in total, and I think one of them evaluated to null if the overall result evaluates to null. So, uh, so ah, think, yeah, 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 yeah. This is okay, the reason okay, that yeah. I inserted okay. this is true. So even in this but, case, uh, this mm -hmm. adding the true test may result that an optimizer can easily trim down the phi already by knowing what it's after. So even this actually may already cause actually uh, an optimizer to be tricked. Uh, I see. Yeah, that, uh, that's one. The other one, uh, I would need to dig into the SQL semantics, but indeed what happens if phi evaluates to, to nil, to null? Uh, then that uh, uh, implicit cast, uh, hence the sum might devaluate to no, which you don't want. Uh, and the is true might avoid that because the is true on null eval evaluates to false. Mm -hmm. so that would be one of the common inconsistencies, but inherently in SQL standard. But uh, yeah, that might be the case. Right, so like, I don't remember, but, but it might be redundant. You, you're probably right. Like, uh, at least for for a number of database mm -hmm. systems. Um, great. Then I will continue with the second technique that I want to present today: TLB, ternary logic partitioning. And um, the idea was basically, or, or the challenge is that NORAC. Um, I mean, NORAC worked quite well. It's easy to implement and allowed us to find bugs. But we wanted to not only limit our testing focus to work clauses. We also wanted to test uh, additional SQL features like uh, to buy clauses, having clauses, aggregate functions, and so on. And this is basically why we um, came up with the uh, latest approach. And the latest approach is based on a more general idea of um, what we call query partitioning, which works as follows. So basically, we have a query generator that generates one query, to which we refer as the original query. And um, you can also see here that I will use this circle to denote uh, the result set of, of the query. And the idea is that we take this original query and um, we derive several other queries from it, each of which computes a part of the result set, so that we can then take these individual parts, um, basically combine them, and arrive at a new result set. And the assumption is that both the initial and the derived result sets are, are then the same. If they actually are, then the database management system seems to work uh, correctly. If not, uh, we have found a bug in the system. So for terminology, uh, we will refer to the derived queries as the partitioning queries and the, the result sets as the partitions. And the operator here, the diamond operator, is the composition operator. So I guess with uh, NORIC, the initial idea that I presented, it seems that uh, um, 
it, it probably seems possible, but of course, in order to realize it, we need to have a valid partitioning strategy that uh, also for which we can provide a composition operator and also that stresses the database management system in different ways. And the approach here is based on the following observation. Let's assume that we have a predicate phi and any given row, then exactly one of the following must hold. Um, phi evaluates to true, not phi evaluates to true, or phi is not evaluates to true because SQL uses a ternary logic, right? Which basically means that a phi is, is null, it's a false, oh, sorry, it's, it's true, it's false, or it's null. Meaning, um, oh yeah, first of all, these um, predicates we refer to as the ternary predicate variants. This means that if a result set like the following, we can take it and build the records based on this ternary predicate variants, basically partitioning this uh, set into three uh, parts. And we use this to realize our approach, and I want to demonstrate, uh, first of all, the approach on a concrete example of a bug that we found in MySQL. So you can see here that we already prepared uh, two rows, T0 and T1, with, um, with a zero value and, and a minus zero value. And you can see here this query that is supposed to fetch um, a cross product of, of records where um, these both um, evaluate to the same value. And um, since zero equals to minus zero should evaluate to the same value, the row was expected to be fetched, which was not the case, and which we reported to the to the developers of, of MySQL. But the question, of course, is how did we find this bug? Because this is actually already the reduced version that we reported. So we first generated original query that simply fetches the cross product of all values uh, from T0 and T1. And this query, we believe, um, is very likely to be processed correctly by the database management system. Let, let's hope that's the case for, for MySQL. And indeed, um, here we received a single row, which is the expected um, result set. Then, from this original query, we derived the partitioning queries. You can see here the ternary predicate variants based on this random, we generate that predicate phi. So here with the not version, and here also the is null version. And these partitioning queries, they would be expected to partition the result set. So basically, that um, two result sets are the same, which was not the case here. You can see that no record was fetched for the partitioning queries, which is why we could detect this bug. So basically what we did is we took the general idea of query partitioning and instantiated with, with the concrete idea of ternary logic partitioning. Whereas the original query, we have uh, a query like this here in, in a concrete example that simply fetches the cross product of values. And here um, with the ternary predicate variant, with the non-negated version, with the negated version, and also with the is null version of, of the partitioning query. And I guess you noticed from the previous example that the composition operator here was implemented with union all, which uh, combines the records without uh, filtering out uh, duplicate ones. Um, because uh, SQL is, of course, based on, on backs and not on, on sets. So we've demonstrated that the approach is applicable to testing work clauses. But uh, as I promised initially, we also wanted to test other features, such as group bias, uh, having clauses, testing queries, and also aggregate functions. So how can we test those? So for, in order to explain this, I want to use this a table-like format here. You can see in the first column, we have the original query. In the second column, we have the partitioning queries with the um, ternary predicate variants. So here, uh, it's basically, uh, this, these queries are instantiated with the three ternary predicate variants. And the third column, explains or illustrates how the composition operator is implemented. So here, just again for notation, we will use uh, the multi-set addition, uh, which corresponds to union all in, in SQL. In order to test having clauses, we can use more or less exactly the same approach. This time we use the ternary predicate variants in, in the having clause rather than the work clause, and we simple, simply copy over any group by clauses that might be generated for the original query. 
and the composition operator is the same. Now for this thing, um, we can see that the original query uses this thing. The terminal predicate variance, they can either decide to use it or to omit it. And here the insight is that we use the union operator, so the set union, in order to implement the functionality that is typically provided by, by this thing. For group by clauses, um, it works uh, similarly. So we can also see that for the composition operator, we use union. And here it's important that we have the same columns uh, here in the select clause that are also used in the group by clause, um, that the filtering of distinct values still works as expected. Now, testing aggregate functions um, becomes a little bit more interesting. And they're actually the, um, the respective test oracle is specific to the aggregate function that we want to test. The probably simplest example is uh, either the max or the min aggregate function, where first of all, the original and the partitioning queries are as expected. But here it's important to note that um, while previously a partition was always a subset of the result, uh, of the overall result, here a partition corresponds to an intermediate value that is computed. So for maximum, um, the maximum basically corresponds to the, to the maximum value computed for the respective partition. I want to explain this, um, I, maybe what I forgot. And here we have an outer maximum to compute the overall uh, value then. Just to also show this on a complete value, you can see here um, a reproducer for a bug that we found in CockroachDB, where we generate uh, two tables, insert values, and so on. And the original query was the following, where we tried to determine the maximum value of, of the row ID for which CockroachDB returned a null. And um, then we derived this partitioning queries where you can see, first of all, the ternary predicate variance again, and that each partition uses max to compute its maximum value. But then we also have this outer max uh, function to compute the overall maximum. And here, cockroach should be unexpectedly returned a zero value. Um, what we saw on the previous slide was a so-called uh, self-decomposable aggregate function. There is also a more complicated category of, of uh, decomposable but not self-decomposable aggregate functions. Uh, I don't want to explain the, the formal background of this, but uh, I guess it gets clear on the example. Namely, if we want to test uh, average, then it's insufficient to keep track of a single value in the partitioning queries. What we actually need to do is we need to keep track of both the sum and the count, basically using a tuple, so that we can derive um, the overall average function in the composition operator. So a single value would, would be insufficient here. Besides this, also non-decomposable aggregate functions exist. Um, one of them is group concat, um, which concatenates strings, where the order is actually um, significant. I was uh, told, I think yesterday or two days ago, that um, this is actually not a SQL, uh, a standard uh, function, but um, at least it is implemented by many database management systems. But here we speculate that there is also less optimization potential um, due to the same reasons. In this approach, we found about 180 bugs, um, over half of which have been fixed. You can see that also we found uh, a number of bugs in DuckDB, but I already mentioned initially that um, that uh, basically Mark and uh, others did an awesome job in quickly fixing them, which is why we could comprehensively test uh, DuckDB. Oh yeah, that's the code I wanted to see here. Um, let's now look at the individual test oracles. So here it seems that we found most of the bugs with the your oracle, which is not only the simplest one, but also seems to be the most effective one. For the other test oracles, we found interesting bugs, but a uh, few another. And um, these additional oracles, we could only implement them for database management systems for which our bug finding efforts saturated, which are highlighted in red, because uh, for the others, um, there were either a large number or uh, yeah, a number of, of open bug reports in the bug tracker, 
and we often generate a duplicate, a duplicate test cases that trigger the same underlying bugs. And what I also want to note here is that, for example, the having test oracle can also find a number of bugs that are found by the were oracle because there is some overlap since having the having oracle also generates, for example, were clauses. And it's more convenient to find them uh, with the were test oracle because it's simpler. How does um, TLB now compare to NORAC? Well, TLB can find features, uh, sorry, bugs in a number of features, such as a distinct clauses group by having and work clauses. We also found a number of bugs in the implementation of union and union all. And uh, which is perhaps surprising is this that it also found uh, bugs in the unoptimized version of joints and also some, some operators. And NORAC. Um, also found some unique bugs, namely where the unoptimized query was processed incorrectly, but the optimized one uh, was processed correctly, and we found that TLB cannot detect these bugs. And with that, I want to start uh, summarizing the talk. So I've presented to you two so-called metamorphic testing approaches. This means that in our context, we have a SQL query, we execute it, we get the result set, and based on these two components, we derive a new test case, which is basically the derived SQL query and a test oracle that can decide whether the result set seems correct or not. And uh, essential limitation of uh, these metamorphic testing approaches is that they cannot establish a ground truth. So actually, um, with the first approach that we came up with, PQS, um, although the implementation effort is the highest compared to NORAC and TLB, uh, PQS can actually establish a ground truth, unlike a NORAC and, and TLB. Um, the advantage of TLB is, as I said, that it can also test additional features like, like aggregate functions, having clauses, and so on. The feedback that we have received from DBMS developers was a very positive so far. For example, the cockroach DB folks have been very supportive of our work also on social media, as, as you can see here. Um, while we are testing IDP um, using the TLB approach, we also participated in a bug hunting challenge organized by them. 22 bugs that we reported were classified as P1 bugs, which is the second highest uh, severity, and six as P2 which is the third highest one. So you can see that actually they considered our bug reports quite important. And actually um, from the number of uh, points that we received, we will be able to redeem them for, for 117 t-shirts. So I'm also looking forward to, to this. Um, now one uh, perhaps mixed feedback is the one that um, is described on the SQLite homepage. So, First of all, I want to mention that um, here the SQLite developers, or, or Richard Hip, um, basically was grateful because he said that our finds are, are real bugs, basically, and even said that they might be, or that the testing approaches might be as influential as EFL, the coverage better faster. But at the same time, um, he also stated that most of the finds were fairly obscure uh, corner cases. And um, while we, of course, agree that a number of, of bugs were, were of less importance. I also want to show you one example of, uh, of an also important bug, which I believe still matters in practice. So you can see here this reproducer for a bug that was posted on the SQLite mailing list. You probably noticed that this um, work clause is actually quite uh, complicated and, and could be simplified. And another user on the SQLite mailing list um, commented on this and said that you can possibly mean to, to write this work clause in, in production code. And um, the user defended themselves, stating that this query was not manually written. It was uh, automatically generated by uh, some middleware. And we actually found this by before the user did. We reported it, and it was fixed on the latest development version um, already. And here, I believe that this shows that even some of the core bugs might actually matter in practice and also affect users, for example, when the queries are automatically generated. Here then, uh, adoption by, by industry. So the first company that has adopted our approach was a pink cap. They implemented all free testing approaches that we came up with and already open sourced implementation. 
we've also received a message that uh, Ocean, uh, sorry, that Alibaba uh, has started testing Ocean Base and found bugs in it. And of course, uh, since the MotoGP uh, solution folks are here, thank you also for having started on on a implementation in, in SQL Answer. And with that, I want to wrap up. So um, I've basically showed you that we mainly focus on finding logic bugs. I have demonstrated that the first approach, NORAC relies on this translation step from an optimized to an unoptimized query. TLB relied on the general idea of query partitioning, which we realized with the more specific one of, of ternary logic partitioning. And overall, the approaches allowed us to find over 400 bugs in, in Vileos database management systems. So with that, uh, thank you for listening and I'm looking for, for any feedback or questions or comments that you have. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very nice talk. And I take the liberty to kick it off before I again Goodbye. wait until everybody has asked questions and they don't get the chance. Um, so well, very nice. I, I love it. I, I have a bunch of questions, as you can imagine. Uh, to, to understand even more of that. But starting with the end, um, you mentioned that, uh, of course, uh, the two approaches you, don't, uh, you presented uh, are inherently like self-differential uh, testing and they don't have a ground truth. Did you encounter any cases, of course, you cannot automatically detect them, I suppose, but did you encounter any cases where you failed to detect a bug because by coincidence, uh, both versions um, for the same or different reasons um, created wrong results, but the same wrong results. Yeah, that's the, 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 the initial and the translated query or the partition and the non-partition. Well, that's, that's a very good question. So um, personally, I believe that uh, first of all, with our testing, we only basically touched the, the tip of the iceberg. And um, with PQS, which establishes a uh, ground proof to some degree, uh, we also did a comparison how many of these bugs could have been found by NORAC. And it turned out only half of them. So there are actually many cases where the database management system works consistently, but uh, but uh, incorrectly. So as you told, uh, as you pointed out, there are probably still like many bugs to, to be found. Okay, thanks. Uh, I give the place to somebody else before I continue endlessly here, but I might jump in later again. Okay, thanks. I can have a question then. Mm -hmm. Well, you know my appreciation for the work and we continue on that, but, but we can uh, talk a little bit afterwards to share some, uh, some on that one. But for the general public, it might be interesting to observe that one of the problems we find in building a database kernel is to have you arithmetic correct, especially dealing with overflow cases. And overflow cases also encode with the is optimized and includes all kinds of castings. So mm -hmm. what is your perspective on how are you going to tackle that area with your approach? Mm, just to understand the problem a, a bit better, um, are you referring to an example where we have, uh, where you internally use some Oh, for example, of... if you're not careful and you do an, uh, an aggregate on portions of a table, and mm -hmm. glue them together actually with uh, statistics, the end result may not be statistically correct because there are arithmetic, uh, especially in the floating areas, um, uh, ditches falling off the, off the, the plate, which mm -hmm. are essential for the end results. And also I can imagine if I'm looking at my astronomer next door, he relies on correct, actually um, arithmetic uh, calculation and the database system to avoid any overflows being generated and ignored like SQLite. It just dumps them off the table. Who cares? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's an area where a lot of effort has to go into a database kernel and it's hard to test. Uh, thanks for the input. So I haven't been aware yet um, that this is a problem in practice, but now that you mentioned it, I think I have to like invest some, some more effort in, into thinking about them. But uh, I think we actually also found a, a couple of bugs that were related to to this um, um, overflow issues. Also, I, I think in Daktib, if, if I remember correctly. So maybe Mark actually has to, to comment on or can comment on this. Yeah, in, indeed, you found uh, one bug that was related to overflow. So it is. Uh, I have to check the door. Sorry, okay, it is no indeed an important issue.
Uh, one, one issue is, for instance, uh, is that um, average, uh, one way of calculating average is to sum and then divide by the count, as you did in your uh, partitioning. Mm -hmm. But uh, the sum can overflow, whereas an average cannot if you do it correctly. Ah, that's interesting. So actually, uh, I think we, we found a, a bug like this in, in DuckDB. I mean, Mike was already aware that this was not implemented. I think it was due to some performance reasons, but uh, actually this um, average oracle allowed uh, finding this, this specific bug, where like um, the, the integer was not promoted to, to a float, I think. Well, yeah. even that is not enough promoting to a float. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, then you lose precision, but you can still get overflow. Uh, which means a null result, whereas uh, an average will always be uh, within the range of the uh, domain, by definition, basically. Except uh, it may be uh, floating point uh, versus integer, but... Uh, it by the way, so sometimes overflow will not produce null, but they will, it will just produce a wrong result. Because the, well, the that's also a bug then. Digits overflow just, uh, must pr produce uh, null according to the standard. Yeah. I see. I think I need to think more about how we could also detect this, this kind of bugs. Yeah, now that, now that we're talking about new kind of hunting grounds, um, uh, well, one of the more complicated aspects of uh, query processing are the already mentioned um, uh, subqueries, especially mm -hmm. if uh, correlated, uh, correlated predicates uh, are present in those. And there is a they are also like um, uh, ex they are also expensive to evaluate if you don't optimize them correctly. So there is also lots of optimization trying to optimize correlated queries, which obviously can contain all kinds of bugs. Um, yeah, so it would be very good actually to to expand uh, into that area and would also be very fruitful uh, probably. Um, and while well, other things, of course, related to that are. Uh, yeah, non-monotonic queries. So um, uh, non-monotonic queries are, are queries where um, more tuples may be involved, but uh, the result may become smaller. You know, mm -hmm. um, negation in in in, 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 in sub queries, for instance, it is also more difficult to um, um, yeah implement and also to detect bugs in them. Oh, that's that's yeah. interesting. Thanks for the input. So actually already started thinking about how we might um, support uh, like the techniques in, in subqueries and uh, I guess uh, your, your feedback gives me further like confirmation that this is a, a good way to go. Like we yeah. also noticed that um, um, researchers from Georgia Tech, uh, I think they worked on um, on a fasting approach called Squirrel and uh, using it they also found a couple of uh, crash bugs in, in the handling of subqueries and uh, I guess it would then be Natural to also try if if we can find any logic bugs in it if, if they also have been successful. Given that they also have been successful, I think subqueries are a very uh, a minefield for a database system. A few uh, last year, I think I did a big um, bug hunting effort using correlated subqueries, and I found bugs in every system I tested, including SQLite. The only system, except Postgres. Postgres was the only system that didn't have any bugs. But it's also one of the things that, like Peter mentioned, the reason Postgres actually does well there is because they have a very slow and simple kind of a, a stupid implementation of subqueries. And, and that is extremely slow once you get to any sort of reasonable data size. You really need to optimize the hell out of this, but that also adds a lot of like potential for bugs. So it's something that I think it will be very fruitful for bug hunting efforts especially in like analytical systems and newer systems. I see. Another one to, to, to recommend is anti-joins, you know, joins with special conditions. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, equi-joins are well understood, but there are also combinations of, uh, yeah, of equi and, and uh, negatives. So uh, where, where you, yeah, so-called anti-joins, so they are also, Especially when nulls come in, actually, it's even hard for a user sometimes to determine what is the supposedly correct answer of these joints. Ah, I see. Okay. 
In, in general, actually, we found that um, many bugs uh, are related to the incorrect handling of, of knives, so that seems to yeah. be a, a difficult part in general. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Neumann has uh, some, some blog entries on, on, uh, on, the, on the extremely weird semantics of nulls and uh, shows that depending on how smart the optimizer is, um, uh, different answers will come out, different correct answers will come out of a uh, SQL engine. Oh, well, I would actually be very interested to read that blog post. So yeah. if you the the, the other to... problem here is that you're trying to, to find bugs into a system that is that is not specified. It's interesting that, uh, um, I mean, whereas there is actually no discussion on what the correct output of a C++ program is, uh, the correct outcome of a, of a SQL engine is uh, extremely vague, uh, so uh, because there there is no no real semantics for it, regrettably. <laughs> so, <coughs> I guess also for for C and C plus plus, it's, it's sometimes challenging with this implementation defined and unspecified and undefined behavior. But uh, but you're right. Okay. Yeah, no, but this is on a different uh, dimension, like the unspecifiedness of SQL actually. Okay. Um, so, brief question from me. Um, I think your question has appeared also elsewhere. But did you try to, uh, you know, throw your the lancer at Oracle, for, or should we do that so you can't get sued? <laughs> <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> no, um, I, I mean, I, I guess it it would be very interesting to also apply it on on all the commercial ones, um, but. Um, like for the number of bugs that we find, it's important that developers actually fix the existing bugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, for MySQL, it was already quite a, a problem um, that the release cycle is actually quite long. So if mm -hmm. like a developer fixes a bug now, then uh, we'll probably expect it maybe in half a year to, to appear um, in the uh, release version. If that, yeah, yeah, it can be much longer. Uh, but but if you um, if you should need any uh, support to set up uh, all these systems, uh, we have uh, some scripts to set up all these commercial guys uh, in Docker containers. So um, yeah, that sounds cool. I think I should go. I should uh, ask you then. Afterwards. Yeah. That's, um, but one like evidence that that we have is actually TLB, like the variants that we are testing, they should hold in general. We, however, opened the bug report for MySQL. Um, the bug report was uh, closed quite quickly, where the bug verifier stated that um, Oracle computes the same result. And, um, and basically, we, um, like we, we said why we believe that this is a bug. So first of all, since the TLB variants should hold, since also NORAC actually would have detected the bug, since the old version of MySQL computed the result that we would expect, and also since uh, systems that support or uh, aim to support the same MySQL dialect like TidyP also computed the result that we would expect, but um, the second bug verifier still agreed that the semantics was, was correct. So I guess this gives some evidence that Oracle might also be affected by, by the same bug that we believe uh, um, affects. But why are MySQL. you surprised? Why are you surprised? Because this is completely in line with what Peter says. And what you also say, finding the ground truth in this, this space is, is hard. So one way of finding the ground truth is, do I at least report the same as my direct competitors? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's sorry, but that's also how things work. And yeah, I think that my school Oracle, Oracle is not the competitor, but the, the superior, shall we say, like the boss, you know? Like my boss says it's correct. <laughs> well, for that you, I think you just order a shotgun to uh, to play games. Well, Oracle won't shoot itself. So, so indeed, what Mark says in this case, it's not the competitor. It's more like, uh, uh, as Mario said, uh, if, if Oracle says something, then MySQL has to say the same uh, because it's the same family nowadays. Not sure what MariaDB <laughs> says, but uh, that's then the other question. But uh, yeah. Uh, I actually forgot another argument why we think it's a, a bug. So it was basically um, a unique constraint was involved and when the unique constraint is dropped, then uh, the query also worked as expected. But, uh, uh, anyway. 
Okay. Yeah. I, I get the whole um, message. <laughs> yeah, I just I just think that they are not fundamentally better, and um, uh, you mentioned earlier that you got criticism from reviewers who are not, you know, mm -hmm. testing the real serious commercial enterprise whatever systems. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that that, that they in any way different from from the systems that you've been testing. Um, with regards to that uh, SQL correctness. I think uh, if anything, they're probably worse. They have yeah. so many more knobs and such that I think like if you consider like SQLite versus Oracle, I would assume Oracle has orders of magnitude more bugs than SQLite. Like it's, uh, I would be surprised if it was the other way around. And it also goes, I guess, in the direction of what, what Martin said. Uh, I guess as soon as you have customers and maybe some service agreement with them, then you cannot change the semantics of your database management system that, that easily anymore, right? Because uh, maybe there yes. are some workarounds in place and, and stuff. I know of anecdotes where Walmart was calling actually yeah. the highest people in, in Microsoft because the query optimizer had improved and turned out actually different answers. And from Walmart, that actually cost them the millions. So here we had a problem. Okay, over. Well. Of course, the solution is just make an if dev if dev Walmart, and then you have solved the problem. That's the way how these guys get solved it. <laughs> uh, hi, hello. This is all the knob. Hang, I have another question, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was just wondering about uh, um, about your um, uh, schema generation and uh, data generation because uh, sometimes uh, it is, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, uh, well, so unexpected uh, uh, actual data that has caused uh, uh, an error. So can right. you comment on that, please? Yeah. So um, as I said, it's actually very important. Um, like often often the um, bug can only be triggered with some specific data, like uh, if the index is created or if like we have seen before for MySQL, if a minus zero and a plus zero is contained. Um, so we believe it's a very important aspect, but um, so far it appears that our naive approach actually worked reasonably well. So I guess this is some part that we should improve uh, in the future, maybe using some of the approaches in literature but, um, but but so far this uh, sufficed, uh, I believe. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, yeah, no, but, um, more or less partly. But uh, in any case, um, thanks. And uh, well, it was a very good um, uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a final a final thought. I mean, you're trying, in fact, with the. Um, uh, partitioning approach you're trying to um, in order to get an oracle you're trying to uh, find rules mm -hmm. kind of rewrite rules that which you know are um, um, will not change the end or should not change the end result and of course um, I mean you try to find these uh, standing outside you know and trying to build this system SQL answer but uh, we are inside such systems and and we have actually code that contains lots of these rules the query optimizer is, is full of it so uh on all of these rules in the query optimizer they yeah they should not they should not change the 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 result of a query um so in fact uh it may be a id to build into a query optimizer um, to go beyond just not optimizing it and fully optimizing it, but you could even suppose that you would have a classical kind of um, um, a classical a classical approach where you make decisions step by step in some way, step by step. Every at every step you make a decision and then you sub optimize, you know, optimize, you make subsequent decisions depending on where you went. Um, so you could actually force maybe the system into a mode where where it will actually where you could control these decisions so that you can generate if you would want to the full space of possible query plans that the system could ever produce and this might be a very large amount of um, of, of queries so you may not want to do that um, but you could potentially do it in a controlled way so that, so that you could bisect um 
back to, I mean, if once you, you kind of you pick a random number, you get a query plan that corresponds to this number. You pick another random number, you compare them. You know, if you have these two, you compare them. Are they the same? Then you're not onto something. Are they different? Then you could maybe bisect back to the to the rule that would, that actually did this. So I'm actually not talking to you, uh, Manuel, but maybe to Mark and and, and, and Martin. Um, maybe maybe one should write query optimizers with the with the debugging task in mind, and and have this have these features. What do you think? Well, partly actually. Remark, go ahead. I, I think it's in, indeed a really good idea to toggle these optimizers. Also, um, one thing that we are going to add is uh, testing different implementations. So, for example, we have a, a merge join, a nested loop join, a hash join. You would also expect all of those to return the same result. You can also iterate over different implementation types that way. Um, and then find bug say one join implementation maybe also some uh, words from my perspective also so um, I also think it's a, a good idea uh, what we have been trying with um, our approaches is that they are basically general so that was a, a big focus so basically we want to have one approach that works on, on any database management system that supports uh, SQL and um, Basically, with, without uh, touching the database management system or without requiring, um, like maybe a, a enumeration of, of all these possible variants uh, of a query, but I agree that uh, practically, I, I think it would be would be a good idea. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's actually amazing that uh, we have been doing this for forty years, and uh, seems like something that you should take into account when you architect a query optimizer. Yes. Hmm. Let's build a new system then. Well, go ahead. So, <laughs> so uh, if I just look at it from the perspective of MongoDB, there are two optimizers involved. Of course, it's on the SQL layer, which is not cost-based. And it's, of course, there's the second pipeline with Mark doesn't like. Uh, multiple stages and in that case indeed in, in the early years of MongoDB I was playing around with all kinds of variations so I had about initially eight different optimizer staff which you could selectively turn on and off so we had 256 different actually um, plans you could exploit to see at least from the mon layer from the physical plan layer things were working uh, correctly uh, it has not been pushed beyond a certain point of uh, sanity it worked so then you start stopping. But overall, one conclusion uh, out there, if you're going to play in this game, there are so many decisions, so many knobs that it becomes really hard to control. Even if you have a traditional uh, cost-based optimized which traverses a tree, just imagine, actually at every tree node, you have to make a decision. And even that decision may depend on the decisions you have taken elsewhere in the whole process reaching that point in the tree. So that quickly actually leads to an, 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 an space which is enormous to, to deal with. So perhaps Mark is right. Just consider, don't optimize anything, do the most stupid, stupidest thing you can do. Use actually correct formal proofing that the, that the stupid approach works. So throw in some mathematics to make that uh, right. And then see if you can improve upon the baseline. And then we know the truth is still in the hands of God. So I think I think um, what Mark, uh, what Manuel just told us um, shows um, something slightly different. And you know, it doesn't matter whether you actually exhaustively test every combination you could possibly have to find each bug that could possibly be there. But if you just do something. And that might be arbitrary, simple in the beginning and grow more complex as Manuel showed so far. And I'm pretty sure of the discussion we had here already before that, and this is not the end of his work, so he will continue with this. Uh, I would highly recommend to, to do so, uh, you know, joining what, what Mark and Martin and Peter and others said before. But, uh, you know, somebody has to start and you, you start, you know, Martin, mind, I say, you don't have to do the perfect job. You just start with something 
and, uh, and, and, and you get somewhere. Yes, the exhaustive part will be out of, out of bounds uh, eventually, but we should think of you know, how, how can we strategically um, cut down that search space uh, to find the most, uh, the most uh, likely problems, the most likely bugs. So the conclusion is very simple. Amsterdam is your next stop in life. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> You're on the job market. Um, so I will probably go on the academic uh, job market um, uh, later this year. Okay. But it also depends on, on, on how much luck I have with the papers. <laughs> Maybe a year afterwards. Uh, but let's see. Okay. Keep us posted. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. I have one more detailed question if nobody else and, and if, 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 if you know people find that too detailed uh, you could kick it off uh, and, and we'll take it offline but about the uh, the the partitioning and we already briefly talked uh, Martin and Schultz mentioned that the overflow with the with the average oracle which might become a problem where your oracle doesn't work anymore because it overflows while it shouldn't and uh, there might be a similar problem with uh, with the distinct and the union uh, mm -hmm. I'm not completely seeing it, but uh, be aware that union semantic only removes duplicates of whatever is union into an existing result. It does exactly. not remove duplicates from the original result. So if, if your first query partition has already duplicates and you know, maybe you mentioned like the, the, this, the distinct can or cannot be there. So for the first partition, probably you would have to, to run it with distinct uh, and only the others you can omit, omit the distinct, but uh, if, if your query is such that the first partition gives duplicates, then the result will be different uh, with unions than the total result. Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess it's also important for this uh, group by uh, oracle where, where we need the columns both in the group by and, and in front. Yes. But, um, so wherever you rely on that, uh, that, that union um, eliminates duplicates, uh, be aware that only what is the you know, what comes from in, in this case, say um, Q minus P and Q, Q prime minus P and Q prime P is, uh, is, uh, is known, uh, will be duplicate eliminated uh, with respect to whatever exists in, uh, in, in the previous results, so in Q prime P, but duplicates in Q prime P should not be evalu uh, eliminated by SQL union semantics. Okay, uh, I guess in the loop, oh, shit. what is again, but... Um... We're in Corona and we have to evacuate the building. So there's okay. a fire alarm here. Um, can you so can you leave Zoom on, uh, Stefan, for a while? I, I can leave Zoom on. Uh, it might be that it uh, ends in a few minutes. It doesn't say anything. Maybe it goes through until three. But I officially have to check now. So otherwise, I better. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, uh, although Shud and Niels are long, long in charge, but still, I, I will live to what I don't learn from them. Um, I will also just leave the recording running and we can probably just cut off the recording. I hope it works. Oh, no, do we still need recording? I guess no, not. I don't think so. Okay, so I'll stop the recording.